podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Okay. I would like to thank, of course, the organizers for the opportunity to lecture here. It's uh, very nice to be back in Munich and to uh, talk to an audience of students, young, young students and postdocs, and uh, tell you about the uh, work uh, I've been thinking about uh, over the last year and a half. So uh, what I'll be talking about is uh, T-duality and a fresh look at T-duality. Uh, you probably know that uh, T-duality for toroidal duality, it's an old subject in string theory and it's been a fascinating subject in which uh, all kinds of ideas have been proposed and uh, even at the early stages of T-duality, there were some unusual ideas about the kind of theories closed strings should be in order to have such property as T-duality. So, essentially what I will be telling you about is a, a fresh look at this question that has um, developed into a somewhat interesting answer. We'll end up at the end of these lectures with uh, some Lagrangians that are very uh, interesting and quite intriguing. And uh, they are probably, someday they might lead to more interesting things as well. But uh, one of the things they bring about is these ideas of mathematics called current brackets and generalized geometry. Now, there's a lot of fairly mathematical and abstract works on generalized geometry and current brackets. And uh, the funny thing is that uh, with these uh, ideas that I will be talking about, they will become something very concrete, something that you see in an action. And uh, you see them just very explicitly. And uh, before that, the ideas were a little more abstract and they were not exactly clear how they fit. So uh, this double field theory um, puts together the ideas of uh, generalized geometry and current brackets in a very clear and nice form so that they become understandable. After all, the current brackets were invented as the natural generalizations of Lie brackets which govern general relativity and current brackets should govern the effective field theory of strings and well you would have asked anybody if 10 years ago or 15 years ago okay so show me the action and show me where the current bracket appears and nobody would have that answer and now we begin to see what the answer is and that's sort of the story that I want to tell you about so uh, there's going to be three lectures, and uh, my lecture notes are handwritten, and uh, I've done them quite neatly, and uh, they will be handed out to you. Uh, they will be photocopied and given to you, and there will be most of the information that what I will say is in here. And uh, there will be some exercises that I will mention as I go along, and the exercises I tend to believe are not really challenging. Uh, they are basically, if you understand the notation and you more or less see what we're doing, you should be able to do them. And uh, so they're not supposed to introduce new concepts, nor extensions or anything, but just pretty much do the simple basic calculations that anybody that wants to understand this in detail should do. So my lecture today will begin by talking about string theory in toroidal backgrounds, mentioning what is the generalized metric, discussing some constraints and ODD transformations. So um, let's do this. So this lecture today will begin with string theory in toroidal backgrounds. the generalized metric constraints 
and ODD transformations. So, as a way, before doing all that, I will give a rather brief introduction to the kind of things we're going to be seeing. So, when you have a string and you have a compact coordinate, a string that lives in a circle, you all know that when you quantize that string, there will be momentum modes and winding modes. So, there's two kinds of modes. So, if you have a coordinate, for example, if you have a space-time with coordinates xi, there will be, say, some compact coordinates xA and some non-compact coordinates x mu. And uh, these compact coordinates, the circles, are associated with excitations, momentum excitations. And uh, this closed string has also winding excitation. So actually, there's a xA and a pA, but there's another quantum number. This is a momentum. There's a winding quantum number, wA, that should be associated to new coordinates, x tilde. And uh, because these are dual to each other, one has the index up, one has the index down, Windings have naturally an index up, therefore the dual coordinate has an index down. So, naturally, the toroidal compactification, there is, in addition to the usual zero mode xA, a dual zero mode x tilde A. So, it is a fact that if you try to write the field theory of closed strings, the complete field theory of closed strings is a field theory that includes winding excitations and momentum excitations. And therefore, if you work in coordinate space, it includes the xA and the x tilde A. So if you were writing a, an exact field theory of closed strings on a torus, every field that you would have would depend on those two coordinates, so all fields are doubled. So every field would depend on the xA, on the x tilde A, and will depend, of course, on the non-compact coordinates. And if you would look at that closed string field theory, the action, that has infinite number of fields because it's a string still would have an integral over dxA, dx tilde A, and a Lagrangian density that depends on xA, x tilde A, and x mu. Here you would have dx mu as well. And uh, because the fields are doubled, the Lagrangian is doubled, and the action is the integral over the whole thing. So, it is a fact that the full closed string theory is a double field theory. It is not a, a speculative fact or a conjecture, it is just true. Now the question is, why don't we have much experience with Lagrangians of this type? And there can be some answer. It might be that uh, this thing is true, but it's true only for the full string theory. The full string, closed string theory has momentum and winding, therefore the full closed string theory has a Lagrangian like that, but if you're talking about an infinite number of fields, that Lagrangian would be fairly complicated and you would probably not have seen it. Nevertheless, there is a possibility that this thing applies to perhaps a limited set of fields. Like, if this is the way things really have to work, perhaps they work for less fields, not all the fields of the string, but if you consider a subset of the fields of the strings, perhaps this still works. So the natural subsector of string, of fields is the one that we call the massless sector, for which the familiar action 
is this. You have a dilaton, you have a metric, and the Palbramon field. So this is a theory for the metric. a Calbramon field and disymmetric tensor and the dilaton. And this is the massless field theory of the closed string, bosonic strings for simplicity. Now, you could ask, what does this become on the light that in fact all of these fields really should depend not just on these coordinates once, but on the coordinates twice? Why don't we have a field theory that sort of involves these fields and has the double property and how would it look and what symmetries would it have? Would T-duality be more manifest here? That is what we're going to try to find, the analogs of this action. So uh, basically, um, in doing this, we will face uh, many issues, but uh, suggestive of the kind of problem that we want to solve is this constructions uh, of generalized geometry. So generalized geometry, in fact, is a very, very mild generalization of geometry. You don't do anything really exotic in generalized geometry. So what is it? Well, if you have... Um, a metric and an antisymmetric tensor, then there are gauge symmetries. So for diffeomorphisms, you have parameters xi with an index up because basically you have a coordinate, for example, that is going to be redefined into another coordinate like this. So this is generalized geometry also, let me say it from the beginning, doesn't double anything. The mathematicians are actually quite reluctant to double things. Um, so generalized geometry works with just x. So what does it do? Well, you recognize that diffeomorphisms, the symmetry of the metric tensor and gravity, is something with an index i. It's a vector field with an upper index. It's a vector field and therefore belongs what is called to the tangent bundle of the manifold. Tangent bundle of the manifold. Then there is, because of the kalb ramon field, Bij, there are other transformations. You know the field Bij has a symmetry, a delta Bij is Di Xi J, minus dj xi i tilde. And this b is naturally called the two form because two antisymmetric indices. And this xi is the other gauge parameter. Xi i tilde is a one form. So it's said to belong to the dual of the tangent bundle, the cotangent bundle. So so far, this is a very familiar thing. The only thing generalized geometry, in a sense, does is that uh, sums these two things. You, you can always tell whether an object is a vector or a one form unambiguously. Therefore, there's no problem in adding them together. So we can call a generalized parameter xi plus xi tilde and you just add them together. And this thing, therefore, belongs to the total, the addition of those vector bundles. And you work with these two things together. You really try to do, treat the diffeomorphisms and the other gauge invariances together. So actually, in working with such gauge parameters, this person, Courant, which is not the Courant of Courant and Hilbert, uh, was a very old guy, but it's a T. Courant, who was a student in Berkeley in the early 90s. 
mathematician, and uh, T. Courant invented a bracket that we will discuss in detail that generalize the Lie bracket and applies to these things. So this bracket was very influential, and uh, we'll see how it shows up. Uh, it's a very strange construction, in a sense. Now, there will be other questions that we will try to answer. So the current bracket here, how does it show up? up. Other things that are interesting are the following. For example, in string theory, the metric and the anti-symmetric tensor, they always come, in a sense, together. In fact, in string theory, it's very natural to combine the metric and the anti-symmetric tensor to form a matrix field that is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. And this is extremely natural in string theory. We'll see again where, why this, is, this happens. Nevertheless, even though it's so natural in string theory, uh, there's no familiar action like this one written nicely in terms of EIJ. You see, you could certainly say, OK, I can write this in terms of EIJ, no problem. Um, take the symmetric part of EIJ, so EIJ plus EJI, and that's up to a factor of 2 the metric, and then I calculate this very complicated tensor. And then I take the anti-symmetric part and calculate this, and that's it. It's a big mess, but uh, you can write it. Nevertheless, there's no familiar natural rewriting in terms of this. So we will obtain one natural rewriting in terms of this object, which is a very nice object in string theory. There's another thing in generalized geometry. So this is generalized geometry. Let's go, I'll summarize, I'll briefly just write it as GG. Uh, both in generalized geometry and in string theory, so I wrote this, and the question is, is there an action in terms of EIJ? Both in generalized geometry and in string th theory, there is something called the generalized metric. metric. It appears in a rather elementary calculation in physics, and it's an object that I will write it as H, M, N. The indices will be explained later. But nevertheless, this generalized metric has been very interesting in string theory. Physicists have looked at it in a lot of detail. And uh, it looks like a metric in a doubled space, because uh, these indices are, in fact, doubled versions of these indices, as we will see later. Nevertheless, nobody has written before this action in terms of a generalized metric. So the generalized metric doesn't show up in any actions that we know about, but we'll see at the end of our lectures one way in which it appears. Uh, yes? Uh, why don't you also include the oh, I will have to include the dilaton as well. Yes, so this whole action will be, will have this EIJ and the dilaton, not quite the dilaton D5 there, but a dilaton um, D. I will will have a dilaton D, a little different from phi. Yes. Mm. 
Well, it's naturally related. T-duality is naturally related to phase space as an invariance of Hamiltonian. So that's sort of how T-duality shows up with phase space. But this is just nothing very exotic, really. You have momentum modes and winding modes. And yes, there are some sort of phase space. And, and the reason also is this duality between the coordinates and momenta. So you just complete the whole thing. You had momentum modes and winding modes, so you must have the full phase space. So dual coordinates accompanying the windings. Other yeah. questions? Sorry? Yeah, it's, we're going to work in coordinate space at the end, for sure. So it's, it's not the, the actions at the end are written in coordinate space, but it's an extended coordinate space. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Well, just like wine, that momentum modes are integers as well, the xA's means that the xA's live on a circle. So because the winding modes are integral, the x tilde a's also live on a circle. So in momentum space, they would be sums. In coordinate space, are integrals over circles. Yes. No, uh, this is not the way, so it's written like this. So the elements, these are, this is an element or a section in this bundle. We just write it with a sum in here. It, it's not, this is a, a, a direct sum of vector bundles. We know what it means. And an element is written like that. It could have been written as xi, xi tilde, but it's more convenient to just even to sum it. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. So just like PAs are 1 over I d dxA, the WA up are 1 over I d dxA tilde. We're going to write classical field theory. You could do quantum field theory later, but we're going to try to write classical field theory just like this is a classical field theory. Well, this, you see, No, uh, you see, this, uh, this is what a, a physics issue here. Uh, the field theory is really doubled. There's extra dynamics in the winding modes. If you integrate them out, you get possibly something like that, but all kinds of very complicated corrections. So this is not like a gauge choice of of that action. These are physically different actions. An action that has only momentum excitations or an action that has momentum and winding excitation are physically different actions. Okay, let me... Um, sorry? So... Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what uh, you're asking, but uh, the double field theory, so what I said is that the full string theory is a double field theory. Nevertheless, we're going to try to write double field theories 
for a restricted set of fields. So toy models, you would say, of the full string theory that have the doubling property. Well, this model is what I'm going to show during this lecture. So um, I'm going to be ex explaining models that look like this, but are doubled to some degree. That's really the aim of this talk. So I think probably we should wait a little to decide how complicated it is. OK, so now let's keep pushing these things. And let me begin with. Um, review of first quantized um, string theory in toroidal background. So, okay, so strings in toroidal backgrounds. Well, there's an action for the strings. So this is a first quantized action. For coordinates xi, there's a g and a j plus epsilon alpha beta, b alpha xi, d beta xj, b and a j, equation one, where eta alpha beta is a two by two matrix diagonal elements are 1 and minus 1, epsilon 0, 1 is minus 1, etc. So this is the action for strings propagating in a background. Now, this background is, consists of coordinates xi. As we mentioned, there are some compact ones and some non-compact ones. The compact ones will be made periodic. The non-compact ones are left by themselves. And the total number of coordinates is d. So i goes from 0 up to d minus 1. Total space-time dimension is d. Now, this gij and bij are backgrounds. So these are gij and bij are d by d constant matrices. Uh, g upper ij is the inverse of g lower ij. So this is delta ik. And uh, more precisely, although we will not look into that too much, this because of the splitting of coordinates into compact and non-compact, there is a GAB here and an Ada mu nu here. That's very simple backgrounds. And the BIJ is going to be a BAB. 0, 0, and 0. And it's useful to define what I was mentioning before, Eij, which is equal to Gij plus Bij. And it's equal, therefore, to Eab, 0, eta mu nu, where Eab is Gab plus Bab. Anyway, that's uh, the definitions. I had to write them all. Um, these are the definitions for this first quantized theory. So now we're going to proceed to find a series of results that are half familiar uh, to people. And uh, some of them will do quickly. Some of them you will do. So. Um,
So the things that we're going to do is find the obvious thing, which is the Hamiltonian. What is the Hamiltonian for strings that are moving in such a space? This is a toroidal background. So even the look of the Hamiltonian will be quite interesting and uh, useful for our developments. B, uh, it's an anti-symmetric tensor. So the most natural background that doesn't break Lorentz invariance doesn't have an expectation value for an anti-symmetric tensor in the Minkowski part of the spacetime. So B, while the metric must have an expectation value for Minkowski space, A w nu, for the anti-symmetric tensor there is none. So basically B just has an expectation value there. This is not the most general background. It's a background that doesn't break the Lorentz invariance in, in the Minkowski part. You could do more general things and more complicated things, but this will be interesting enough for us. Yes? DBI actions? Okay. Not really. Um, I, I'm not sure what similarity you're talking about, but uh, these are, you know, the original discussion of toroidal backgrounds. This is uh, fairly standard and simple because everything is supposed to be constants. Um, so the, all these matrices are constants. So let's um, proceed here. So, so from this action that you have in there, you can get the canonical momentum conjugate to the xi. So 2 pi pi is equal to gij x dot j plus bij xj prime. It's a functional derivative. Then you can form the Hamiltonian. These are relatively simple manipulations, but uh, and it takes out a matrix form like this. So you put the d the coordinates x prime over here, prime is a sigma derivative, dot is a time derivative. Those are the two-dimensional derivatives, dv sigma and dv tau, h of e, and x prime 2 pi p. And this h of e takes the following form, g minus b g minus 1b, bg minus 1, minus g minus 1b, and g minus 1. So it's a 2d times 2d matrix. So exercise number 1, exercise 1, these equations are equations 2, three and four, and exercise number one is prove two, three, and four. Um, I hope, I think all the factors are right. My lecture, I, I, I'm gonna try to have everything correct with signs and factors of two. So if you find a factor of two wrong, let me know. But uh, the aim is that everything is really precisely right. Now here, this matrix is symmetric. It takes a second to see that. This is symmetric. B is anti-symmetric, but the transpose of this will have two signs, and this is symmetric. So this is symmetric, this is symmetric, and the transpose of this is this, 
uh, because G is symmetric and B is anti-symmetric. So this is a symmetric matrix. And in fact, uh, this is the matrix that is called the generalized metric. And eventually, when we'll put the indices, the so-called ODD indices, this will be identified with an object HMN that is symmetric. Now, at this moment, it doesn't look at all like a metric, except that it's symmetric. It rather enters here in the definition of the Hamiltonian, and that's how it first appeared in physics. Now, this H has a nice factorization that leads you to understand one property of this matrix. You can write it as 1, B, 0, 1, G, 0, 0, G minus 1, 1, 0, minus B, 0. This is the product of these three matrices. And then, we can calculate from here H minus 1, the inverse of the matrix H. Uh, well, you could try to guess what the inverse is, but now it's very easy in this form. You just take the inverse of these things and multiply. Um, H minus 1 is equal to G minus 1 minus G minus 1 B b g minus 1 and g minus b g minus 1 b. This is actually this 2 exchange and this 2 exchange. So it's related to h by this exchange. Oh, yes, one, one, one here. Wrong copying, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody's checking in real time the calculations. That's good. Okay, so this is uh, H minus 1, and uh, this suggests the definition of yet another... Another matrix, if you define a very useful matrix, eta, which is going to be 0, 1, 1, 0, then so this is going to be equation, this is equation 6. Uh, where is 5? Um, 5 was h. Nope. No, 5 was the factorization here, 5. And h is this, h minus 1 is 6, and this is 7. Then you can easily check that eta, h eta, is equal to h minus 1. So um, this is a rather interesting constraint of this generalized metric. So this generalized metric is not an arbitrary 2D by 2D matrix, but it's a 2D by 2D matrix that has been built from G and B. Now G and B together form a D by D matrix, and here you've built a symmetric 2D by 2D matrix that has to be a constraint metric uh, because it has just too many variables. And uh, this is the constraint that it satisfies. Um, now let's put some indices there. So I'm going to move this one there. So. I'm going to 
to put indices in a suggestive way. Um, so let's look at this. So we said that H of E will be associated with an H M N when we put indices. So it's natural, if this is supposed to be a metric, that this will H minus 1 would be associated with H M N. Inverse matrix, metrics and metrics are always written that way. But let's look at this equation over there, eta h, eta equal h minus 1. That, in order to get the indices to work, the h on the left-hand side must have its indices up. The h on the right-hand side must have its indices down. So we will put an eta p m. Let's associate with eta indices down and an eta mq, and we get this. This is equation um, this was equation 8. So in here, we'll have equation 9 that will be in this form, H M N, eta M P, eta N Q is equal to H P Q. And what does this say? This is equation 9. What does this equation say? It says actually that you could think that you have actually not only the generalized metric, but this eta should be thought as another metric. So we have two metrics, the h, which is the generalized metric, and eta. And if you raise and lower indices with eta, you can lower the indices of h with eta, and you get the h inverse. So this is a somewhat unusual interplay between two kinds of metrics that are important in t-duality. The eta metric lowers the indices of the generalized metric and gives you the inverse generalized metric. So this will be not. Okay, now um, let's see more ingredients that come from first quantization. So. you have a mode expansion. If, if you do the mode expansion of the coordinates that live on a circle, there are the alpha n modes and the alpha n tilde modes. And, uh, you know, those are things that we used for the coordinate expansions. There are the zero modes, alpha zero, and alpha zero, maybe I should use bar, yes, bar, alpha zero bar, and uh, those alpha zero, if you've seen t-duality before, they're essentially alpha zero and alpha zero bar are p plus w and p minus w up to signs. So I want to get that precise, so I'll give you the formula of what they are here. You don't have to derive this formula, but alpha zero i is one over square root of two, g i j, p j minus e j k, w k. And these formulas that maybe you've seen before, p plus w and p minus w, are the simple cases in which the there's no background anti-symmetric tensor, and these are unit matrices, so they simplify. But there's alpha zero i, which is one over square root of two bar, gij, pj, 
plus E K J W K. Yes, I'm sorry. It's alpha zero and alpha zero bar here. This is just what you may remember these things were in simple cases. In the precise case of a toroidal background, that's what they are. Now, these things define nice derivatives. So how do we write nice derivatives for these things? Well, I will find it useful to lower the index. I lower the index by just deleting this g, because the g, after all, is raising the index here. So alpha zero i, and alpha zero i bar are gonna be equal to, I'll have just the one over square root of two, but I'll do another thing as well. I will just turn the p's and w's into derivatives with respect to coordinates. So I want to see this as differential operators, so I will just replace p by one over d d x i and uh, w by one over i, also the i, one d d tilde x k. So here, let me write it, you will see it immediately. d d x i minus e i k v d x tilde k and alpha zero i is minus i over square root of two d d x i plus e k i d d x tilde k like this. You see, the g disappeared and these things became one over i times derivatives. And um, that's good. This is gonna be defined as minus i over square root of two, and this derivative I will denote as capital Di, and this minus i over square root of two, capital bar Di. Two nice derivatives that we have uh, in the theory. So I will move, uh, are there any questions? Uh, about this notation? Yes. So where do you get the uh, function Where do I get what? The function like p and coordinate. Where do you get the p and coordinate? Well, this is the standard thing that we said well, at the beginning that we think of the p's as dual to the normal coordinates and the windings as dual to the extra coordinates. So, if you want to think as basically this is the coordinate space representation of these operators in coordinate space and they inspire the definition of interesting derivatives. That's all there is to it. So, one second. I'm gonna just play with these two blackboards. I think it's enough. So, Okay, so we have these nice derivatives and now let's write them a little more explicitly and relate them to the Virasoro operators. So this is following familiar steps in string theory that may or may not be too familiar, but, uh, but they're definitely standard steps. So we have these derivatives that we've introduced. So let me write them a little more briefly. Di is Di minus Eik, d tilde k. You see the normal derivative has an index down, the dual derivative has an index up. Di bar is Di plus Eki, d tilde k, and we will define, if you have a di up, to be g i j d j, and d bar i up, g i j d bar j. Okay. Virasoro operators. We need to understand something about the Virasoro operators, 
as you will see in a second. So consider the Virasoro operators. L0 is one half alpha zero i g i j alpha zero j plus n minus one. N is a number operator. An L0 bar is one over half alpha zero bar i g i j alpha zero bar j plus n bar minus one. Okay. What about these operators? Well, the reason these operators are important to us is because in closed string theory, there is one constraint that is universal and is never avoided, and it can't be solved for, and can't be eliminated, and can't be replaced by a Lagrange multiplier. You can't do anything about this constraint. And it's the famous L0 minus L0 bar equals zero constraint. All states in the closed string spectrum must satisfy this condition. You cannot even begin to write a closed string amplitude unless your vertex operator satisfies this constraint. Yeah. Uh, Bij is in the alpha zeros, so they show up uh, in the Eij. Yes, the the B is still there, uh, but it but it's. What is what? That's right. The Virasor operators are like that. Um, that's just a fact. Right. Now, yes. So, actually, you know, I'm starting to abuse a little notation. I don't want to keep splitting the indices in A and mu. So, I'm writing everything with I. So remember the xi's were the xa's and the x mu's. So when I write xi tilde or dd xi tilde, I must mean something like x tilde a and x tilde mu. But we don't double those ones. So these are set to zero. And that's what you should mean by x tilde in general. If you have a non-compact one, you just put zero. Uh, I suggest that you forget about that little technicality because it, if you try to make it too explicit, uh, this works. You write the doubling like that, but you're really doubling the non-compact coordinates only. Or you can assume everything is compactified, whatever you prefer, but it doesn't introduce trouble. Yes. Yes. The the one what here? So the alpha and alpha bars. Alpha and alpha bars. Yeah. Well, uh, these are a little different because these are derivatives. So, um, so probably not. Don't try to identify them that way. We'll see some other ways in which uh, we connect the tildes that we had before to these derivatives, but not quite yet. So let me continue with this constraint. This is a fundamental constraint. This is yes. Uh, 
kan ik even weer op uh, een ontvang. Ik uh, uh, ontvang een liefde tegen mij, tegen de voor. Ik voel uh, spin. That's right. So actually, you cannot do string theory. Uh, you can do conformal field theory without this constraint. But you cannot do closed string theory without this constraint. It's big difference, because conformal field theory is a fixed Riemann surface. But string theory is sum over surfaces. And that causes very many complications that this becomes necessary. So you cannot allow, in a closed string background, you cannot have a single operator with non-zero spin. OK, yes? Look, this is. At this moment, are coordinate independent, coordinate independent. All these are coordinate independent. They're constants. You can raise the gij is the symmetric part of this thing, and the gij therefore has an inverse, which is with upper indices. I, I never raise or lower these indices. These e's always have them down. So there's no such thing as eij defined. I will not attempt to do that. Those are indices that we decided that eta can lower the capital indices of this equation. So those are fine. And eta, and in fact, if you have the matrix eta, you can also see that the eta with upper indices and the eta with lower indices are inverses of each other. And they are the same because this matrix that eta is, is its own inverse. No, uh, the, you see, these are the indices of the matrix H. The matrix H, that we don't have it already there, was 2D times 2D. So M and N indices run from 1 up to 2D. They're doubled. OK, so what is L0 minus L0 bar? Well, I'll, you can subtract these things and write them in terms of these derivatives that we have in here. So just a little computation. L0 minus L0 bar is actually equal to n minus n bar minus 1 half times another 1 half di di minus d bar i d bar i. It's a quick computation. Just replace that alpha zeros are in here. They're essentially the d's. And therefore, the d's have their indices up. And with this thing, they become contractions like that. And the result follows after a line of algebra. So your exercise number two um, is to show that, in fact, this difference is quite neat. This difference is the following, that exercise 2 show that 1 half of di di minus di bar di bar is equal to minus 2 partial i partial tilde i. You might say, wow, this is going to require lots of cleverness to, to show. It, but it actually works out in a very nice way. And you see, was all this metric disappears. The di and the di have the e's here. But the claim is that this difference, all of it goes away. And you're left with this contraction of the normal derivatives and the dual derivatives, some sort of Laplacian but uh, involving the two derivatives. So, 
so let's um, see what that gives. We're almost ready to understand the basic constraint of double field theory. Well, L0 minus L0 bar must be equal to, one, uh, to 0. So what do we get? So given this exercise 2, we get that L0 minus L0 bar must be equal to 0. So n minus n bar must be equal to 1 half of this minus 2 di di tilde, which is minus di di tilde. So that's it. That's a constraint. But what kind of constraint is it? Well, uh, these are number operators. This is a differential operator. What's the meaning of this constraint? Well, it depends what fields you're going to use in a field theory that uh, describes closed strings. Now, the fields that are natural to include are fields of this kind, or I'll put sum over P and W. E, I, J of P, W, alpha minus 1, I, alpha minus 1, bar, J, C1, C1, bar, P and W. Look, this is a state of string theory. It's a first quantized state. It is, you may remember, in closed strings, the alpha i, alpha bar i, the symmetrized part of it multiplies the graviton fluctuation. And the anti-symmetric part of it multiplies the Kalbramon fluctuation. In fact, if Eij, which is a fluctuating field that we could consider to be the gravity fluctuating field plus the Kalbramon fluctuating field, enters in closed string theory this way, these are ghosts. And this is a PW state. This is a first quantized state. So actually, this constraint says that for this state, n minus n bar must be equal to this thing. Now, this is in coordinate space, and this is in momentum space. So this is essentially uh, P dot W, or P I W I in momentum space. But let's think of this more precisely. This state has n equal to n bar. The number of left moving oscillators and right moving oscillators is the same. You see, here you have one here and one there. Left moving, right moving, they are the same. So this is 0. So p times w must be 0. Or in terms of the Fourier transform field that we said we would have in this theory, a field Eij of x and x tilde is the Fourier transform of this. This should satisfy d i. Well, um, I will write this also as d dot d tilde, like that. The dot meaning sum over i. So d dot d tilde must be 0 on this field. The dilaton field also is familiar in first quantized theory. And it's V of P and W, C1, C minus 1 minus C1, C minus 1 bars, PW. This state also has n equal to n bar and both 0. So this state must also be annihilated by this operator. So this field, the corresponding dilaton field that depends on x and x tilde, must also be annihilated by this operator. So in fact, every field at the mass, so-called massless sector must be annihilated by this operator. And this is a fundamental constraint. If you 
ever would try to do a double field theory, you may not suspect it, but every field must satisfy this constraint, must be killed by this funny Laplacian. Now, this is one of the reasons early attempts to do double field theory never got anywhere. Uh, people did try to invent some field theories that have X and X tilde, but the constraint was not there. And without this constraint, you really cannot get off the ground. Now, I've not written an action at all for these things, but soon enough, in next lecture, we'll write such an action and begin to see why this constraint is absolutely necessary. So, if you're going to have a double field theory, there is this additional constraint that is inescapable and uh, can be eliminated. Yes? This is not the same as the feed dilator, correct. Okay. Uh, and uh, what is this uh, connection between the uh, Yes, uh, there is a connection between this dilaton and the phi dilaton that I wrote, and the connection eventually will show up that e to the minus 2 phi times square root of minus g is equal to e to the minus 2d. They are related, but um, they're not the same. So, we've covered now the first quantization. So, what we're going to do in the last uh, part of it is understand the t-dualities that we're going to need to work with. Um, so, um, maybe I'll go now to the top blackboard. And... Um, and uh, begin the t-duality discussion. No, no, there's no way that anybody knows to put the dilaton into the generalized metric. Uh, people have tried. And as you will see, it's not supposed to be there, and it's not really necessary either. It's sort of a little funny, that, uh, but it's very interesting that actually by the time you try to write, so you would say, okay, string theory may have its opinion, but uh, you have an EIJ, which is GIJ plus BIJ, and you try to write a natural action for this that just has gravity and this and no dilaton. Well, you find it almost, it's almost impossible to get it to work. And uh, if you may get it to work, it's very unnatural. But once you put the dilaton, it becomes very natural. Essentially, the dilaton, this dilaton furnishes densities that you need to construct actions. Well, there's no natural way to get densities from this thing, and no natural way to get densities from the generalized metric just depends on G and B, and doesn't depend on the dilaton. So you might say, oh, is there an action just for the generalized metric? And that doesn't seem to exist either. So uh, the dilaton plays a role. It's quite uh, Remarkable. In fact, if you double the coordinates, you must have a dilaton. It's almost uh, inescapable. So, ODD. So that will be the last thing we'll do today. Um, and um, it's preparing the grounds for the things that we're going to write uh, next time and the last lecture. So, ODD transformations. So. It's an invariance of the physics. Now, what we're looking for, ODD transformation. So actually, let's look at the Hamiltonian of the theory, which is the integral, d sigma, of the Hamiltonian we wrote before, at the beginning of this lecture. Now, this Hamiltonian had uh, the p's and the x primes and the generalized metric sandwiched in between. So, you can start calculating it, and uh, 
you get the following result. That I'm not going to ask you to try to get it, but it's suggestive that you will get this. Z plus N plus N bar plus some little bit more of junk. Now, what are the Zs? The Zs are column vectors, Wi and Pi with a momentum quantum number of states and a winding quantum number of states. So you see the Hamiltonian or the energy of each state receives a contribution from winding and from momentum and from oscillators. But let's look at winding and momenta. Well, basically you can put together the winding and the momentum like that, and here comes the same generalized metric we had before. And the L0 minus L0 bar condition actually gives you that N minus N bar is one half Z transpose eta Z, where eta is the metric we had before. Now that shouldn't surprise you if you think of Z and eta, Remember, eta is off diagonal, therefore z's times eta mix w's with p's. And what we were doing before with L0 minus L0 bar had in the second blackboard top line a p times w there. So this is the full n minus n bar what it is in terms of all the quantum numbers. So. Here it is. Uh, this is the spectrum and the set of states. You give me some state with some oscillators, and it must satisfy this constraint. That is L0 minus L0 bar equals 0. And its energy, the Hamiltonian for that state, the energy of such string state, will be computed with this state. So if we have a symmetry of this theory, must mean a transformation in which you take the set of states and you maybe change their labels, but you see that in fact you have the same physical state. So we can attempt to change the labels of the states, the W's and P's, shuffle them, but we want to guarantee that the physics remains the same. So let's reshuffle P's and W's we shuffle P's and W's. How? Let's introduce Z and let it be equal for convenience a matrix HT, H transpose, Z prime. The transpose is put there by convenience. Now, Z is a 2D column vector. And therefore, H is a 2D times 2D matrix, if it's supposed to reshuffle them. So this must be an invertible matrix. So these Z primes are related to these Zs in a one-to-one -one way. OK, if we reshuffle this, what's going to happen? Well, if you have a state, you have then a Z prime. And if that's supposed to be another reasonable state, it should still satisfy this condition. So whatever n minus n bar is, that shouldn't change. So what we'll have is that z prime t eta z prime must be equal to z t eta z. The state should satisfy still that condition. So that should not change. Now z here is z prime h like this, eta h transpose z prime. So what we need is that h satisfy h eta h transpose eta equal eta. Need this. A rather simple exercise, not completely trivial, but exercise number three. 
is show that this thing implies actually that HT, eta H, is equal to eta as well. And you don't get it by taking the transpose of that equation, but it's still pretty straightforward. Um, so, one second. Um, so, so there was a question. What was it? Oh, uh, it's conventions. Uh, everybody um, uses this equation as the definition of a group. The, if you have this, H, the set of H's form the ODD group. That's the way everybody writes it. So, and now it's important to show that if H belongs to the group, H transpose actually belongs to the group. That's sort of the claim that uh, these two equations are really the same. And uh, H inverse should also be in the group. And these are simple matters to check. Um, so for example, H will typically write it as, it's a 2D by 2D matrix. So we'll write it as A, B, C, and D, where these are A, B, C, and D are D by times D matrices. So this equation gives you a set of relations for these matrices. A transpose C plus C transpose A is equal to zero. B transpose D plus D transpose B is equal to zero. And A D transpose plus B C transpose is equal to one. For example, those are important equations. Uh, the other form, H eta H transpose equal to eta, gives you another three equations that are in the notes, and you can write them uh, what they are. And uh, actually, there's quite a bit of exercise that go on in playing with these formulas. Uh, they're a little non-trivial sometimes to work with them. And uh, for example, exercise four is to show that H minus one is D transpose, B transpose, C transpose, A transpose. It's very easily obtained from H. Okay, but we didn't get the spectrum totally um, fully constrained. We said there's two conditions for the spectrum. The n minus n bar should be preserved, but then the total energy, the h over there, should be respected as well. So what should we have? Well, you could say, look, we have zt, H of E, Z is part of this Hamiltonian. It's an integral part of it. It's the most important term. We're reshuffling these quantum numbers. Should this be equal to Z prime T, H of E, Z prime? Should that happen? That's too much to ask. That doesn't happen, and that's not the way it works. What happens here is that this wouldn't be true. So what happens is that actually you put an E prime here. You see, 
this transformation that reshuffles the quantum numbers will also reshuffle the background field. And then we have a, a chance of making this work. So if this is true, that this holds only because we change E prime, then it's possible that it works. So what is the left-hand side? This is Z transpose prime H little h, h of e, h transpose z must be equal to this. Therefore, you need, one second, h of e prime to be equal to h e h transpose. You need this. You see, Z and Z prime are related by the H transpose. And now, this can be true. If you didn't change this, this would never be true. So the question is, if, is this possible? Possible. Well, it is possible, and we'll do it in the last few minutes. Um, So this says that you have to change E as well. So now the question is, how should you change E in such a way that H of E transforms that way? So this has a famous answer. But as you're probably realizing, this generalized metric has a rather remarkable property. This ODD group is characterized by the H matrices. Whatever it does on the metric and then the anti-symmetric tensor, a T-duality transformation, which is based on the H matrix, it does something very simple to the generalized metric. It just transforms it uh, covariantly on one side and covariantly on the other side of the matrix with H. It's as simple as it can be. Now, uh, how is E prime related to E? It's a little more non-trivial, but uh, it's famous too. The claim is that in order to realize that, the claim, is in order to get this to work, you need that E prime be some function of E related by the matrix H. Now, this notation is not H of E, because E prime is obtained from any E. So this is the, the notation is saying the matrix H acting on the background E. So this. Some, other, some people write it like this, A, B, C, D, that's the matrix H, acting on E, which is as unclear as the first one. So this is unclear, this is unclear too, but both notations are used because they're brief. But what this really means is the following. This A, E is a matrix, so it's actually A, E plus B times C, E, plus D, minus 1. It's a modular transformation. Now, um, this is a very complicated transformation. The back, the, this, remember, this is G and B. And this is part of what I told you that E is natural in string theory because the T-duality transformations are naturally written in terms of E. But if I want to write the formula for G prime equals something and B prime equals something, they're very complicated. We will have to sort out the G prime, actually, to understand more ODD. But they're very complicated. E is the natural variable in string theory. And uh, 
this will lead to that result that we have there. Now, actually, you can imagine that the direct computation of this fact is very non-trivial again. Why? Because recall what H was. H of E was something like G minus B, G minus 1, uh, B, then B, G minus 1, uh, minus G minus 1, B, and G minus 1 here. And now I'm supposed to calculate H of E prime and show that that holds. Well, H of E prime, I would have to put primes here, and I've been told it's a mess. So this looks like an impossibly hard computation to do. What it means is that it has to be done sort of cleverly and with a little bit of a conceptual way. And we won't do it today, but we're almost ready to do it. So I'll just wrap up with a couple more comments that will set the ground for this. And uh, the first thing is an exercise that you will find useful later. Show that E prime T is equal to A minus B minus C D on E T. In the same notation that I used here. So this is the transformation of the, the transposed things. And the funny thing of this formula is that you don't see the transpose here, but somehow it works out, and you have to just think a little how that can work. Uh, so uh, let's do one last thing to prepare the ground to show this result. So this, you know, I wanted in these lectures to show at least some of the very classical and fundamental results. And this is one of the most fundamental results, that this transformation and these transformations are related. So for this, we'll just do one more thing. is to imagine, imagine creating E from the identity. What does that mean? Suppose somebody gives you a background E, and you say, look, I want this background to be created by ODD action on the unit matrix. So ODD action on just the unit matrix. Can I get any background by ODD action on the unit matrix. If I can, then things will start simplifying. So this is a very useful concept, and I will call this ODD matrix HE, if it exists. And actually, it does exist, and it's a rather clever one. And here it is. Um, suppose E is G plus B, as we usually write. And now you have to do one more thing. G is symmetric. Therefore, it can be factorized just like you factorize matrix with field binds, can be written as a matrix times its transpose. Any symmetric matrix can be written as A times A transpose, like that, with some A. The A is not unique because you can change it by some further transformation without changing E, just like fear binds are not unique. You can do Lorentz transformations, but they allow you to write a metric as the product of two fear binds. So suppose you know A, or some A, then I claim that HE is nothing else but A, B, A transpose minus 1, 0, and A transpose minus 1. Now, I would have to show first that it's an ODD matrix, but you have the constraints of an ODD matrix over there, and uh, you can multiply H transpose eta H, and you will check that is in ODD, 
this is in ODV. And now let's calculate what it does acting on the identity. So HE on the identity is supposed to take the first element and multiply by the identity, add the second element, B A transpose minus one. And then in the denominator is supposed to be zero times the identity plus the last element, A T minus one, and all minus one. That's what the H action is supposed to do, A E plus B C E plus D. So what do we get? We get A plus B, A transpose minus one, times A transpose minus one, minus one, so it's just A transpose, and then you get A, A transpose, plus B, which is G plus B. And we succeeded. This ODV transformation creates this background acting from the identity. And it's the last result we're doing today. Um, next time, we will use this to prove that formula for the generalized metric and finish probably in about half an hour our discussion of ODV transformations then setting the whole subject uh, so that we will be able to write those double field theories and check that they are duality invariant. So we'll stop now. Thank you.